ladies and gentlemen, we hope you enjoyed lunch. We now move to the formal part of the afternoon, and I would like to invite Gary Starr, General Manager, Business and Government, International, Australia Post, to the stage. Thanks, Gary. Thank you, Max. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to welcome everyone to our venue today. And whilst we're excited to have all of you here in the room, we'd especially like to welcome our virtual guests who have just joined us to the event. Many of you are joining us from Australia, but we also have guests joining us from New Zealand, Singapore and the US, amongst other countries. And we look forward to your participation in the Q&A discussion a little later in the program. Australia Post is delighted to partner with today's economic forecast event. Our organisation's purpose is a simple one, to connect people with each other and the world. And today is a great way to connect both here in the room and around the world. It has seen Australia Post provide a core service for all Australians and within communities right across the country for more than two centuries. As an extension of this, Australia Post, in partnership with the banks and other financial institutions, including those represented by our panellists today, to ensure equity of access to financial services. Our ability to support the people of Australia has been a driving force through times of uncertainty and adversity. Whether it's natural disasters or the global pandemic, our doors have remained open where possible to provide a trusted point of presence in communities with access to personal finances, in-person support and financial assistance. It is a privileged position and I thank those organisations who trust us to represent them in this way, including CBA and Bendigo and Adelaide Bank, whose customers are many and diverse. Today we will hear how leaders of these organisations have helped steer their customers and Australia through an historic chapter in the country's history. This is an opportunity to listen, reflect and learn from experiences of the past year and consider how these will guide our path forward. For our business, the pandemic accelerated the trend towards e-commerce, with people buying online in numbers we hadn't forecast for another five years. And it disrupted our ability to deliver the 650 tonnes of letters and parcels ordinarily carried by domestic passenger planes each week. As I flew to Sydney last night, there were 10 people on my flight at 6.30, so there's a way to go before we see many more planes in the air. Throughout it all, we were guided by a clear strategy at Australia Post to protect our people, safeguard our business and continue to serve our country. We retrained 2,700 posties to, to work through vans and deliver parcels. We chartered 18 dedicated air freighters and we put 3,000 extra vehicles on the road and we stood up 60 pop-up sites. In preparation for our busiest Christmas ever, we hired 5,000 extra people to help us deliver for our customers and as a result, we moved 52 million parcels and 7,400 tonnes of air freight and we serve 21 million customers through our post offices in the month of December. That's 52 million parcels in 28, rough, roughly 28 days. These are achievements that we just could not have conceived a year ago. And getting to that point hasn't been without immense cost. And I'm really proud of all the people at Australia Post who've delivered those outcomes. But by sticking with our strategy and keeping our customers at the heart of everything that we do, I'm optimistic about what can be achieved in the year ahead. It's a similar story with our financial institutions that play such a pivotal role in the lives of millions of Australians, directly and indirectly. As always, we remain committed to working with our banking partners to enhance the services on offer to all Australians. We look forward to hearing our panellists share their insights into what may lie ahead. I would now like to hand over to Andrew Smith, Group CEO and Executive Director, CBHS Health Fund, to provide some opening remarks. Thank you. Thanks, Gary, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests. Uh, further to the opening, uh, I'd just like to acknowledge Johnny, who is going through a difficult time, as was expressed earlier. I know Johnny, in his own special way, will not be able to uh, avoid today's event, and Johnny, I know you'll be dialing in, and just please be aware that all of us here will be thinking of you at this difficult time. When reflecting on what I would focus on for the introductions, uh, I was reminiscing and uh, I had the pleasure of introducing Matt Common two years ago when he was first appointed to CEO and after 12 months was coming out publicly with his strategy for CBA. And then last year, I had the honour of introducing the panel 
and it was with a, an ABA approach and what was happening in the marketplace post the Royal Commission. So just reflecting on the last year's journey, I think for me personally and for a number of people amongst us who've been through those two sessions, for all of us, we've been inspired by the leadership journey, we've been motivated to make positive change. And so on behalf of everyone here, I'd like to firstly congratulate Matt and what CBA has done in terms of leading the business community and also Anna, on behalf of everyone here, what the ABA has done. It has been truly inspirational for the, for the country and for the community. And with our part that we play in the healthcare sector, I have to say that the hand in glove comments where finance and health have really come together in the last 12 months with the pandemic. CBHS's association with the CBA this year celebrates 70 strong years. We've been really encouraged by Matt and a number of his team who are amongst us here today and their commitment to the staff within the CBA structure and also to the communities that they serve. And many of you will remember Matt's remarks about bringing the CBA strategy back to core banking and back to looking after the community. This last 12 months with COVID and the global pandemic, it was, I think, the greatest challenge in at least 100 years facing business. And to show such great leadership and to have such great impact on the business community has been really heartening to see. And we see it at CBHS from within. The CBA team has allowed us to bring in health programs and wellbeing programs within their staff community. And with COVID, we've been able to do what many organisations uh, have done, and that's pivot into the technical and digital augmentation. So a number of our physical health hubs have now gone into virtual health hubs. We've now looked after 250,000 interactions with those programs. We've had skin checks, We've had mental health programs in place, and we've been providing valuable health and wellbeing solutions to the staff of CBA. Our not-for-profit member-owned ethos has really resonated in the last 12 months. We're owned by our members, but we this year have been inspired by the financial community generally, and their fine balance between looking after various stakeholders but importantly, the community as a whole has been second to none. The healthcare industry has pivoted holistically. We've seen telehealth solutions delivered in enormous scale. We've seen deliveries of medications directly into people's homes, and that is with the help of Australia Post and reliable uh, distribution providers. We've seen hospital operations being done, but rehabilitation being done in homes. We've seen our patients and our members do technological advancements through skin checks using mobile apps. So for me, it's been an interesting, challenging year, but it's been a revolutionary year from a healthcare setting. And I'd just like to end on the fact that as a not-for-profit member-owned fund, we have a strong alliance to about a third of the private health industry through an association not dissimilar to the Australian uh, Business Association or Banking Association. It's called the Members Health Fund Alliance. And in November, there was a survey conducted nationally around the health and happiness of the nation. And you'll be very pleased to know, and not surprised, no doubt, given how well as a country we've managed COVID, but 80% of us are saying that we're either extremely happy, very happy, or happy with our, our life. But I'm also here to flag that if you're one of those people, what the survey signaled was that there were 72% of us that were not living our lifestyle in healthy ways. We were drinking to levels that were regarded by specialists as being too, too much. 
We were not eating healthy vegetables and healthy fruits. And mental health was going undiagnosed and untreated in a third of the surveyed responses. So I am appealing in this forum where strong leadership in a financial setting has been displayed to please take back to your environments, whether it's for you personally, the teams that you lead, the family environment in your community more broadly, please ensure that you are looking for signals, signals that might trigger more serious health concerns and responsibly deal with those and don't put them off. We are very aligned with the AMA and its public appeal to ensure that the nation puts its health as a priority number one. So that is my personal appeal to you today. But I did introduce by saying that the healthcare industry and the financial sector has worked hand in glove. And like our previous speakers, I hope you enjoy the panel today and the interesting economic discussion points that will eventuate. To conclude, I'd now like to introduce you to a short video that the ABA has provided on how the industry has responded during COVID. Thank you very much. Fantastic. So I get to introduce myself. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is David Oakley. I'm the Managing Director for ServiceNow, and I have the real pleasure of introducing our esteemed panel members. ServiceNow underpins many of the world's leading digital businesses. When you think of organisations like Disney+, Plus, Uber, Apple, and we've got the great privilege of working with many organisations here in this room as they go through their own digital transformation. Uh, so thank you to Commonwealth Bank, to Australia Post and to many other organisations that put their faith in our organisation. And myself and the local team are very passionate about the role that we play in helping on that digital transformation. I think all of us would recognise, and it's been highlighted through some of the introductions earlier, the critical role that technology has played over the last year, and I think we all appreciate the critical role that technology continues to play as we look towards the future. And our role is to provide world-leading technology to Australia's organisations and to make sure that we've got the commensurate skills and capabilities to fully leverage that. And I think we all appreciate how critical that is to the economic outlook and the economic prosperity of this nation, both individually and collectively across our uh, collective businesses, states, territories, etc. And uh, we look forward to continuing to support many of the organisations here in this room. And our panellists, of course, know that only too well and have great insight to the economic pulse both here in Australia and New Zealand. And so I'm fascinated to hear what our esteemed panellists have got to say and uh, provide outlook on this afternoon. I now invite our panel up to the stage and I'll briefly introduce 
each of them as they make their way up. Uh, firstly, Matt Common has been Chief Executive Officer and Managing Director of the Commonwealth Bank of Australia since 2018. As CEO, Matt is focused on building a simpler bank, fully aligned to meeting the needs of customers in core markets, underpinned by stronger risk management and a continuing commitment to innovation and customer service. Our second guest is online. Uh, Marnie Baker has been with the Bendigo and Adelaide Bank Group since, two th uh, sorry, since 1989 and an, an executive of the bank since 2000. She was appointed Managing Director in 2018, has over 30 years experience in financial services, and Marnie is a professional and motivated executive who demonstrates value through engagement, collaboration and innovation. And as I said, Marnie is joining us virtually from Melbourne today. Dr. Andrew Charlton is Managing Director of Accenture Strategy. Andrew has senior experience in business, government and international institutions and is well known as the senior economic advisor to Australia's Prime Minister through the global financial crisis. He has authored two books, Ozonomics and Fair Trade for All, and in 2011 he was named a young global leader by the World Economic Forum. And finally, I welcome our moderator for today, the Honourable Anna Bly AC. Anna is the Chief Executive Officer of the Australian Banking Association, and her priorities include strengthening the culture in banking and delivering the right outcomes for customers. Anna has had a long and distinguished career in politics and was the Premier of Queensland for almost five years. Uh, please join me in welcoming our distinguished panel. Thank you. Well, thank you, David, uh, and thank you to all of the sponsors of today's event and to Trans Tasman for joining with the ABA in kicking off 2021 with uh, this lunch. A number of you I know were here last year and speaking to many of you uh, prior to sitting down, I know uh, that like me, this is your first in-person event uh, of this size. It's quite exciting, really, <laughs> uh, and I'm looking forward to hearing from our panel today. Um, we, uh, as you know, 2020, um, could be described as one of the most uncertain and unpredictable years we've had. And today's event, we really want to focus on understanding a little bit better what happened during that year, and more importantly, what are the implications of what happened last year for this year, and what can we think about and look forward to over the next 12 months and beyond. So I am going to start with Andrew Charlton. Andrew, um, I'll start with a, a couple of questions to you to give us a bit of broader economic context, and then I'll come to uh, Matt and to Marnie Baker to talk with us a little more about their own experience in their banks. So Andrew, let's start with uh, some of your observations and what the data is telling you about consumer behaviour, uh, such as their spending and saving patterns, both during and coming out of the pandemic. Thanks, Anna, and thanks to the ABA for hosting this event. Uh, look, 2020 was the year that broke all the consumer spending charts. Uh, everybody had to change their axes, uh, I'll account for structural breaks that they'd never seen before, and almost every aspect of the consumer experience changed. We saw huge changes in what people buy, where they buy it, how they buy it, and how they pay for it. Uh, in terms of what people buy, we saw a huge shift towards anything to do with the home, and huge shift towards digital products and a massive premiumization trend. Uh, in terms of where people buy things, there was a big change in the distribution of economic activity across Australia. Uh, a big shift from CBDs into the suburbs. It was a really bad time, 2020, to be uh, running a cafe on George Street, but a really good time to be running a business in a local suburban high street. Uh, a huge shift in, the, in where people buy things in terms of the rise of the online channel. Uh, in our data, we saw cohorts of Australians that really had very low online purchasing penetration suddenly overcome the fixed barriers uh, to purchasing online uh, and take it up in droves. Uh, my parents started buying online groceries for the first time during 2020, and they haven't stopped. Uh, since then. And then finally, a big change in the way that we pay for things. Uh, a massive fall in cash and a big rise in cards, including mobile wallets and buy now, pay later. So these are all seismic 
changes in consumer behaviour. Uh, not all of them are new. Some of them are accelerations of pre-existing trends that sped up during the crisis. And not all of them will be persistent. Uh, one thing for 2021 that we are watching very closely is the question of who is spending. Uh, in 2020, we saw a big bifurcation in the spending patterns of lower and higher income people. There was a huge lift in the spending of lower income people relative to their normal baseline and a drop in the spending of higher income people. And that was for a number of reasons. Lower income people were much more likely to be going to work rather than staying at home, expanding their consumption possibilities. Uh, secondly, lower income people were much more likely to be recipients of government stimulus. Uh, and third, they have uh, higher essential spending and lower discretionary spending, which always buffets spending in, in a crisis. And so we had a big lift in the spending of lower income people offset by a fall in the spending of higher income people. As we leave 2020 and head into 2021, we're starting to see that flip. We're starting to see the spending of lower income people coming down, associated with the wind down of government supports, and the spending of higher income people really rising. One of the trends that is uh, coming through very strongly in the data off the back of that is premiumization. Uh, lots of growth in higher end categories and higher end brands. So I think 2021 will be an interesting year for every consumer facing business, trying to grapple with those trends, which of them are here to stay, uh, which of them are temporary, and how are they gonna play out as the economy continues to change. So given all of that, I think it would be fair to say uh, that the economy today uh, is, not, is nowhere near where we had feared it might be in July, August last year. Uh, and I wonder what parts of those trends do you think is driving some of what is a stronger than anticipated rebound? Yeah, well, it is definitely a stronger than anticipated rebound. Uh, I think anyone sitting in a, in a discussion like this uh, nine months ago would have been very, very nervous about where we'd be today. Um, you know, the bottom line is that it's been an extraordinary recovery. Uh, if, you think about, if you think about the recovery in labour market terms, we are 90% back. At the height of the crisis, we lost about 12% of employment. 12% of all hours worked were lost at the height of the crisis, and now we're back to less than 2%. So we're nearly 90% back, at least in terms of the labour market recovery. And that's after 10 months. And that is an extraordinarily short period of time. If you think about the last two recessions that Australia experienced, in uh, the 80s recession or the 90s recession, 10 months in, we were still on the way down. Mm. Employment in those two recessions didn't bottom out until 14 and 16 months after the start of the crisis, and then took another 20 months to climb back to where we are today. So by historical comparison, this is an extraordinary rebound. And there are lots of reasons for that, lots of reasons why it's been faster than a typical recession. One of, them, one, of course, is the nature of the crisis. Uh, but one has been the nature of government support, which I just want to call out as being quite extraordinary and different in this crisis. Um, uh, I, I used to teach Economics 101. And um, when you teach Economics 101 and you're talking about recessions, uh, ironically now, uh, one of the ways that you teach the impact of recessions is by using the analogy of a virus. You say, uh, in a recession, uh, I lose my job. Uh, when I lose my job, I then spend less money at the butcher. Uh, the butcher has to lay off staff and they spend less money at the baker. The baker then has less money to spend at the candlestick maker. And the recession is transmitted like a virus through the economy. And that is how recessions work. In this crisis, the policy innovation that was wage subsidies, uh, implemented in the form of JobKeeper in Australia, but also in the UK, in New Zealand, and many other countries, was like the economic social distancing uh, of uh, recession combat. It meant that when there were people in the Australian economy who lost their job, rather than transmitting that shock to all of the uh, service providers and recipients of their purchasing power, the government came in, 
and resurrected that purchasing power and stopped the transmission. So in a weird link of fate and analogy, uh, we started to combat this, this virus-induced recession in the way that you combat a virus. Uh, the government pumped in, if you add together JobKeeper, JobSeeker, uh, Stimulus, and Early Super, that was about a $95 billion injection of cash into the household economy. Just a staggering amount of money. The virus cost the household economy $45 billion in lost wages and unincorporated business income. So the government was putting in nearly $2 for every dollar that the virus was taking out. And that overwhelming force was one of the significant reasons why this was such a strong rebound. Um, and I, I think it would be fair to say you add to that uh, the efforts that Australian banks collectively um, brought to the Team Australia requirements. Uh, you know, bringing their financial firepower to into play and effectively acting as a shock absorber for both businesses and households. So I might bring Marnie um, and Matt in uh, now. Um, you all know Marnie and Matt as the leaders of um, their own banks, but uh, Matt is also the chair of the Australian Banking Association and Marnie is the deputy chair. And together they um, have led an industry uh, that has uh, proved, I think, critical to Australia's ability to fight um, a recessionary virus. Um, so I'd be interested to hear from both of you, Matt, if we might start, sure. um, you know, what are you seeing um, with your customers? Um, are most of your customers through the worst? Um, what are you seeing in, um, you know, sort of mortgage customers versus your small business and, and even larger businesses? You know, what, what are you seeing looking to the next three, six months? Yeah, no, thanks, Anna, and thanks for the opportunity to, to speak with everyone today. Maybe just picking up on a couple of, uh, I'll just underscore a couple of points that Andrew made. Certainly from our perspective and the broader industry, I think it's been a, you know, a remarkable recovery over the last six months, but vis-a-vis -vis where we were nine months ago uh, overall. And, and I, I think it's really underscored, obviously, the effective management overall of the pandemic. It's been you know, world leading on a relative basis tremendous uh, government support. Uh, initiatives clearly put in place by the banking industry to, to assist with that support. We've been um, really surprised by a number of different features of the, sort of the resilience and robustness of the Australian economy. One has been this sort of substitutability between sort of uh, services and goods and how quickly some of the expenditure and consumption uh, came back. I mean, as you know, as Andrew was talking about the you know, the virus analogy, just seeing I mean, consumer confidence I think is at sort of seven year highs, uh, which is I, I think pretty remarkable given the context of you know of what we've been through, and so over the the course, particularly over the last six months, and from a financial system and institution, we obviously um, look at the labour market very uh, very carefully. It's a, it's a key indicator, and the recovery in the in the employment market, again, and yesterday's jobs number was another strong number. We're down to, you know, 6.4% unemployment. I think there were various probably estimates somewhere between seven and 10% at various points uh, last year. Our economics team thinks that will be down below 6% by the end of this calendar year. So, I mean, to your point, Anna, uh, we put very substantial support in place across the industry and it was very well uh, you know, coordinated and a lot of commitment across both you know, regulators and individual institutions. Nobody fully knew exactly what that would be after the six months and some of the additional measures that we put in place. Happily, and you will have seen this with a number of banks reporting in the last uh, 10 days or so, the numbers are looking extremely, extremely good. Uh, you know, somewhere in the order of sort of 85 to 90 percent of people who've come out of who were in home lending deferrals are now out, and by and large, uh, the, almost all of them are back at sort of pre-COVID uh, repayment deferrals, uh, sorry, repayments, and even stronger in business. And I think that's probably, that's been one of the areas that we look at um, and have worked uh, very closely with businesses all around you know, the country. And again, I think the resilience that we've seen displayed in lots of different sectors, uh, you know, has really shone through. I mean, we do think over the next three to six months that there will be some uh, continued uncertainty. There'll probably be some degradation in, in, in certain, uh, you know, parts of the economy because, you know, a program as, as uh, significant, as effective as JobKeeper does need to, is going to need to come to an end. But there's a lot of, you know, positive, uh, I think, tailwinds from our perspective that we think are also going to 
really help to offset that. One is the, you know, the significant savings surplus that's been built up. We put that at more than a $150 billion, which I think is really going to help with consumption uh, during the course of the year. Continued gr uh, growth in jobs. And then you know, thirdly, you know, housing nine months ago we saw as a risk. And we probably thought it might fall by, you know, peak to trough by about 10%. Uh, it fell by two. And you know, our forecast this year is it's going to grow, rise by 8%. Just a, again, another you know, re remarkable turnaround given the, the amount of, I guess, household wealth and the flow through to the broader economy. So uh, happily, I think we're, we're all seeing some very strong economic data at the moment, um, which should give us, you know, notwithstanding still some difficult and some uncertain times, no doubt, I think give us real cause for optimism in the year ahead. Marnie, what's it looking like in your, um, in your part of the world? Yeah, thanks, Anna, and, and hopefully everyone can hear me all right. And I'm sorry Perfect. I can't be there in <laughs> person today. Um, I actually am in regional Victoria. I live in Bendigo, so uh, coming from there. Um, look, Andrew, you know, the behavioural aspects you were talking about before absolutely is, you know, we've seen some really seismic change in the, in the behaviours of consumers and, and businesses, you know, through this period of time. And I think Matt hit it on the head when he talked about the you know, the resilience uh, that we've, um, you know, that we continue to see uh, in individuals and, and businesses alike. And, you know, I'll probably put my comments more towards uh, the regional areas, given our presence uh, in the regional areas and our close connection to communities right across Australia. And, you know, it, it, it hasn't surprised me at all because especially in the small business end, the small to medium business end, um, you have to be resilient to go into those businesses to start with. And the, how we've seen small business adapt during this period of time has been quite remarkable, adapting in the, in the products that they offer, uh, adapting in the, uh, the ways that they operate. And, you know, in essence, as they're doing that, they're making their businesses a much stronger business for, for the long term. Um, big businesses and small businesses alike, you know, had to really have a look at you know, across their, their cost base uh, and, you know, and the different levers that they can, they can pull, uh, again, which will make them uh, so much stronger uh, uh, coming out because they'll have a much better understanding of their own, of their own businesses. Um, but I think, Anna, just, you know, around regional Australia, I think we mustn't forget that some regional communities also faced, you know, disastrous impacts from bushfires mm. and floods and droughts. Uh, even before sort of COVID hit, um, and some of those are more significant, have had a more significant impact than COVID has on their on their communities. But there's, you know, really strong evidence that um, regional Australia is recovering, and and um, you know, a lot quicker than the larger capital cities. And one of those indicators is the you know the rise in regional house prices and and that outperformance of um, the major cities. I think I was looking at some data the other day because like Matt, we've been out. Um, uh, with our results uh, over the last week. And, um, you know, it, it, it's interesting just having a look at just the change that has, has occurred. And I'd be interested in Andrew's comments too, what he sees between, he mentioned the suburbs in, in, um, in the capital cities and the migration. But we've definitely see the, seen the migration from uh, cities uh, out into the regional areas too. Um, and that's not a new phenomenon. That's something that's been happening now for, uh, you know, at least the last two census surveys, you'll see that. But COVID has most definitely uh, accelerated that. But we're seeing housing prices in, you know, in regional markets are up, um, you know, 7% compared to 2%, um, you know, in the, in the city. So that's, that's quite a shift. We haven't seen that, you know, for more than 15, 15 years. Um, the migration data, like I said, the, I think the Australian Bureau of Statistics, um, they produced some, some information just recently um, that showed that we've had the, the biggest quarter in, in net migration out into the, into the regional areas. Um, and this is really supporting some, uh, a real uplift in, um, in growth out in regional Australia, pushing up, like I said, pushing up house prices. Um, potentially pushing up uh, wages as well. But there's a great, uh, you know, the great thing to come from this, um, you know, after having this sort of inherent risk of 40% of our population being in two cities in Australia, um, is that we actually are spreading um, uh, the population. And people are 
been given the, uh, the ability to decide uh, where they want to live um, because knowing that they can actually live and work and operate businesses from uh, anywhere in Australia. So um, it's very interesting to see what's happening. Um, the recovery, you know, again, I'm just reiterating what Matt said there. We we're all very pleased to see that it wasn't as deep uh, as what we'd first anticipated um, and the starts of the recovery have come quicker than what we first expected as well. Andrew, as we go into 2021 and we've got vaccines beginning to roll out here in Australia from next week and in other jurisdictions already underway, what do you think will be the challenges in terms of managing COVID and its impacts in 21 as opposed to 20? Um, you know, international borders are probably the one that's going to linger the longest and no doubt both Matt and Marnie will have um, you know, businesses on their books that will continue to be impacted um, in a number of sectors by those international closures. So how would you see that economic challenge? Uh, look, I think as we, as we start 2021, we need to recognise that we need a very different strategy for managing COVID than we had in 2020. Uh, you know, in 2020, the Australian government and, and many businesses did a great job. Uh, they responded rapidly, bluntly, and for the most part, effectively. Uh, however, a lot of those restrictions came at massive costs. We've already talked about the cost to the economy, the cost to mental health, domestic violence uh, has been mentioned today as well. So as we head into 2021, we have to manage the virus differently. Uh, the beginning of that is recognising that the virus is not going away. Uh, we know that even though Australia might get good vaccination and achieve herd immunity in the latter part of this year, there'll be many parts of the world that will not. And the international aspects of COVID will not go away in 2020 and could be with us well into 2022. In addition, there's an enormous amount of uncertainty still out there. There's a lot we don't know. We don't know a lot about the durability of vaccines and the possibility of reinfection. We don't know a lot about the potential for mutation, particularly into strains that are vaccine resistant. So we need to accept that COVID is gonna be here for potentially a long time to come. And therefore we need to manage it in a different way. Uh, and that means ensuring that we can open up the economy in a safe way. I'm not suggesting we should be trading off uh, better economic outcomes for worse health outcomes. That trade-off doesn't exist. And we've seen in every country that's tried to do that, that it's been a false trade-off. But what we do need to do is recognise that we're in a very different position than we were this time last year. And we need to achieve the best health outcomes at the lowest economic cost. And what does that mean? Well, I think in practice, it means three things. Firstly, it means ensuring that every state jurisdiction lifts up to best practice. We have way too much variation in capabilities across states, uh, particularly in quarantine, tracking and tracing. And we need to lift everyone up, up to best practice in a national standard. Secondly, we need to make sure that restrictions are targeted and proportionate. You know, well done to the New South Wales government for taking the risk in the Northern Beaches and other places showing that less blunt instruments, more targeted, more proportional instruments can work. And that has shown Australia and frankly the rest of the world what is possible, achieving great health outcomes at much lower economic cost. And third, I think we need to work with government and business. And 2020 provided great examples of that. Uh, certainly the banks uh, provided enormous support to the government and, and the community. Uh, there's been lots of cooperation between many sectors in working out how we can safely reopen the economy in 2021. So all of those things I think are the elements of a new approach, recognising that it's not 2020 anymore, but also this virus isn't going away. Looking ahead uh, into 2021, there are a lot of things happening in banking uh, that aren't necessarily directly related to COVID. Um, we've still got Royal Commission um, recommendations being implemented by the government. There's a lot of legislation in the parliament. But, you know, they say that in, the, in every crisis, every crisis presents opportunities. And it's clear that the government is taking the opportunity to look across the regulatory landscape, uh, moving to simplify and modernise in some cases, um, you know, and redesign things to make them more fit for purpose. So a good example would be the moves to facilitate at both a federal and state level 
um, e the use of e-signatures and digital witnessing of documents. I think the, the crisis kind of suddenly presented with the fact that you know, we had lots of legislation requiring us to use you know, the, um, the, the, uh, the mode, the methods of the last century. Um, but one of the changes, and probably more controversially, um, the government currently has reforms to the credit laws, um, currently before the parliament, uh, very keen to make sure that there is an efficient and effective flow of credit into a recovering economy. Um, you know, Matt, I'd be interested from your perspective, how do you see those proposals by the government to change some of, not all, but some of the regulatory landscape around lending? And what do you think it will mean for your bank and for your customers? Yeah, no, thanks, Anna. And I think that, you know, the, as you said, the context is, is really important. And um, you know, we we're just talking about how difficult it will be for population growth in the context of closed international borders. Then, you know, other key elements that drive e economic growth are, you know, participation rate. And, and we're actually seeing that come back to pre-COVID levels and then productivity generally. And I think that you know, the government's focus on a few areas of real productivity reform and digitization, specifically within uh, responsible lending. I mean, the key is really not to increase uh, borrowing capacity or indebtedness, not to water down uh, any of the consumer protections, uh, but to recognise that perhaps some aspects of the, um, the way that loans are processed at the moment, this is the heart of the reform, is inefficient and uh, not overly uh, helpful to the overall process, certainly from a customer perspective. As you know well, it is somewhat controversial insofar as making sure there's that balance right and there are complete assurances with the regulatory oversight from APRA, with the protections from AFCA, from the Code of Banking practice, that there is no watering down in the, in the consumer protections. And so I think there's it's absolutely a practical reform which will, make, which will deliver benefits for customers in a more ef efficient uh, lending process, which I think also goes to you know, broader confidence and reliability and, and access to credit. I think that will be one of the, the topics for, for the banks this year, not just in housing. I think uh, most importantly, it will also be very focused on business investment. I think that's gonna be one of the key areas um, that we'll, we'll all be looking at. I think, you know, non-mining bus business investment has been, uh, was sluggish for some years pre-COVID. There's a lot of public infrastructure uh, develop, development that's going on now. And so making sure that there is a, you know, a, a free and available supply of credit to the key parts of the economy to help encourage, along with you know, broader sets of initiatives, um, you know, further investment, I think is important. Marnie, can I bring you in here? Um, I think it's fair to say that there are probably some competitive issues as well, um, tied up in how different size banks are able to um, process applications um, you know, varying abilities to use technology uh, to automate the collection and verification of data. Uh, what do you think these changes will mean in a bank like yours? Yeah, you're right. You're right. And for Anna, your customers. And, um, yeah, I know that um, there'll probably be some regulators in the in the audience there. So, but I I think they would probably agree uh, with me that traditionally. Um, you know, changes in, in legislation, changes in regulation, sort of lag, um, movements in customer uh, changes or customer preferences and, and behaviours. Um, and that's what we've traditionally seen. And I think, um, you know, if there's been a, a, an opportunity that, that sort of came out of what's been, you know, a tough, a, a tough year for, for consumers and for businesses alike is you know, that we did see regulators sitting down with industry, we did see uh, uh, regulators sitting down with government and, you know, looking at different, um, you know, ways of actually resolving things and some things that have been there for a, a while. And now I know this is a government uh, initiative, um, but as we look at what the government was, you know, trying to do here, I think it can only be good for, for customers. I mean, the reforms seem well targeted to me, you know, they're around improving the customer experience. It is, it is tough and, um, you know, all banks alike and uh, smaller banks have to, have to uh, abide by exactly the same as the larger financial institutions do, um, you know, so you don't get a lesser, a lesser regulation. 
um, and that's pushed you know, onto the customers. And, and you know, when it comes to responsible lending changes that they're talking about, you know, it really is at the customer end. It really is about streamlining um, you know, the application process around collecting you know, the, the data that's actually collected, which, which is you know, on the customer to provide that uh, information. It, it's you know, like Matt said, it doesn't go to the, the underwriting standards of a bank and those sort of things don't change. And it doesn't make any sense at all for a bank uh, to lend money to someone that they cannot repay. Um, you know, and to put someone into debt that they, they won't be able to get out of. That, that doesn't work for a, the consumer, it doesn't work for, for the bank. You know, so I, I do think that these reforms are targeted at the right end. I think they're targeted at, um, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, to make it easier for those customers with the ability to service their, their debt to be able to get access, you know, um, to, to, to banks, to financial institutions to be able to do so. Um, and I'm you know, I, I am pleased when I see uh, legislation and reforms that actually are targeted uh, at the customer end. Thanks, Marnie. Um, there's been a lot of changes in customer behaviour and Andrew, you alluded to your parents. Um, it's certainly a trend that banks have seen right across um, their customer base that there's been a rapid acceleration of um, take up of digital channels. This trend was occurring anyway, but it has been you know, exponentially accelerated through COVID, largely out of necessity. We expect those changes to remain and for more change to be, um, for more change on the horizon, particularly in that payment system space. Uh, the RBA is currently reviewing that, as is the Federal Treasury um, on behalf of the government. There are new players and old players and all, every, you know, there's a lot of churn and flux happening. Um, there is a proposal on the books at the moment for some of our local payment systems to merge. Uh, so Matt, I might start with you about your view about the proposed merger of BPAY, FPOST and the MPP and you know, how that might impact the system or make it work better for customers. Yeah, look, as you said, Anna, I think uh, payments is a, an area of enormous uh, innovation globally in financial services. I think Australia has a very good payment system. I think it's extremely important it continues to have a very innovative payment system. We would see uh, as part of that, uh, that it's important to have an efficient um, domestic payment scheme to compete alongside uh, the global schemes like Visa and MasterCard. There are of course other payment providers and platforms that have come into the market as well, like Buy Now, Pay Later. And so I think historically the the FPOS, uh, BPAY, NPP, I think, you know, slightly fragmented. We do see that there's important benefits that will make a, you know, an overall a stronger domestic competitor to um, make sure that we're continuing to innovate and provide the most cost-effective, um, you know, payment solution in Australia. And increasingly, what I hear from small businesses when, when we're out seeing them is, everybody recognises the big shift to electronic payments. There's a big focus on making sure that we have a very efficient and low cost uh, payment system, um, which it certainly is on, on a global basis, but we, we really recognise that that's going to be an area where um, we'll continue to you know, deliver even better pricing to businesses. And I think this is one step uh, in enabling um, you know, greater competition by a stronger domestic, uh, domestic payments player. Um, thank you. I'm going to open um, questions now up to the audience. Uh, we have microphones. There's two at the front of this section of the room and two over here. For those of, um, those of you who are listening to this session online, and welcome to all of our virtual guests. Uh, it's, you can now submit a question. Uh, I think you can do that through the chat function, but it will come up here and I'll be able to ask it on your behalf. So I'm going to invite uh, the audience uh, to come and ask these fine minds some questions that might help all of us think about 2021. Do I have any takers? Okay, then I'm gonna put, I'm gonna start picking people. <laughs> I'm gonna pick um, David from Judo Bank from my table, because I know he wants to ask a question of Andrew. <laughs> um, and I'm sorry, we, for reasons to do with the hotel, we don't have roving mics. If you wouldn't mind, you need to come up to the front here, so. <laughs> this is a real conscription. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm going to randomly start picking other people, so. 
But uh, yeah, so it was a it was a conversation we were having actually over the table, which was a question for Andrew about <coughs> you know if you sum up many of the things that you've just talked about, which is unemployment sort of dropping to six point four, which is two three percent below where we thought it might be. You've got more liquidity in the system, I think, than any of us have, have ever seen. Uh, you've got absolutely low interest rates. You've got consumer confidence recovering. But you also have a central bank governor that says rates are going to stay very low for the next three years. Th there's sort of parts of a puzzle that it's not easy for us to put together. Um, and some of the markets around the world are starting to sort of have the long ends of their yield curves start to tilt up sort of suggesting at least some building of inflationary pressure. So particularly interested in your view, Andrew, just on the likelihood of emergence of inflation ahead of what many economists are calling it. Look, you're absolutely right. You know, there is, uh, there is something here that feels like it does not compute. We've got a uh, roaring consumer economy, falling inflation, rising asset prices, bucket load of liquidity in the economy at any time in our lifetime that would have caused the inflation light to start blinking on the dashboard and we'd be very worried. Uh, however, the RBA has signaled that they do not intend to raise interest rates over the next three years uh, and don't currently forecast an outbreak of inflation. So why? why? Why do these things not add up in the way that they once may have, may have? And the answer is that the RBA has a different view of what they think the level of economic activity, particularly the level of, in, of unemployment, is that will cause inflation to take off. And the implied level that the RBA is suggesting is the level at which the economy will start to get tight, will get pressure on wages, that pressure on wages will feed through to higher wages growth and higher price growth. The level that they're implying th uh, that we get to that point at is an unemployment rate of about four and a half percent. And they are not forecasting that we get to that level of four and a half percent in the next three years. Therefore, we don't have an inflation risk over that time frame. That's the, that's the base case. What could go wrong with that base case? Well, firstly, uh, we could have uh, breakouts of inflation that are unexpectedly strong. Uh, I think one, one risk is the United States, where the economic recovery is very strong, and we are about to see a torrent of fiscal stimulus that could lead to some inflationary pressure. The other is in spot fires in the inflationary environment. You know, one thing that COVID has done is create a lot of winners and losers across the consumer and product landscape. We've seen some areas where there's been a lot of inflation and some areas where there's been a lot of deflation. Uh, uh, deflation in some parts of the economy which were restricted from activity, uh, but lots of inflation. You know, anyone who was trying to book a domestic holiday or uh, my nephew tells me trying to buy a jet ski uh, was, was paying over the odds. Um, so there are, there are risks there in the inflation uh, outlook, um, but the central case uh, is for inflation to remain well anchored over the next three years. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I do have a question from the Honourable Member for McKellar, Jason Belinsky. I think things are about to get hotter in the room. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. You know I'm not honourable. Um, uh, my question to the panel is this, uh, twofold. Firstly, should we trust an economist without a PowerPoint pack? <laughs> and my second question is, um, I was just trying to do the maths in my head, but I, I think Andrew and Matt and Marnie, Marnie. Um, the last six re global recessions have been created by asset bubbles bursting. And I wonder if our... Um, central banks and our reserve banks focus on consumer inflation and price inflation is misplaced and should they have a broader perspective that includes assets as well? 
Who'd like to start, Matt? You want to sure. take off on that well, one? I, I think to, to part A in this case, yes, for, for Andrew. B, I feel like it's a dress rehearsal for House Economics <laughs> Committee uh, appearance <laughs> in a couple of months' time. Uh, no, I, 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 yes. Um, oh, look, um, there's a number of different factors that they clearly, uh, you know, taking into account. As Andrew said, there's a got to take the spare capacity and reduce unemployment down to a rate which delivers wage growth. And uh, I think the, the, the central view would be very much based around trying to obviously get inflation into that target range um, as part of that and sustainably into it. It has been, I think, low for some time in terms of uh, wages growth. I think it makes a lot of sense to have all of the um, policy from a fiscal and monetary perspective around recovery in the labour market, given the, the significant shock that we had last year. I don't know that I would describe the RBA's stance as not one of considering asset prices. Uh, I, I know they, they do, although I'm sure they consider a whole range of different factors. And I think the, you know, the reality is that's one of the things that we, we you know, financial institutions, regulators need to keep an eye on. At least, and obviously there are many asset classes, but if we just talk about housing as an example, I think one of the things that gives us uh, confidence collectively at the moment is, and Marnie touched on this, it's, you know, it's a disperse and composition um, that is very different to when we've had real accelerations in, in housing in particular. If you go back to 2014, 15, most of that growth was coming out of Sydney and Melbourne you were seeing 60% of new financing in New South Wales and in Sydney of investor. At the moment, you know, the fastest growing uh, capital city is uh, Darwin, then Perth, then Canberra. Uh, There's a number of regional locations uh, are growing uh, very rapidly. In fact, Sydney and Melbourne are not performing uh, strongly on a relative basis and investment lending is currently running at about 23%. So it's probably half of where it would be uh, a few years ago. So it's not, I, I, of course, there are always risks around asset prices and you've got then affordability constraints. And, um, but at, at least at the moment, the composition of owner occupier, first home buyer, there are real incentives for people who, uh, you know, to come into the housing market at this point in time. And you know, in this particular instance, I don't envy the, you know, the governor's role having to weigh up all of the um, you know, various economic indicators and you know, to deliver a policy platform that they, f they think will effectively reach those outcomes. But I'm sure this won't be the last of this issue. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's hard to believe it's only um, 2017 that APRA introduced um, macro prudential or pulled on their macro prudential levers to dampen um, investment, um, you know, investors in the housing market. So, um, yeah, it seems like a long time, seems like a long time ago now. Marnie, did you want to add to, um, that question from Jason, particularly around, you know, how you're seeing the RBA's settings at the moment, or their thinking. Yeah, look, yeah, cons uh, consistent with what Matt said, and you know, and, and right across the industry, I think you know, around, you know, our own book was you know 85% owner occupied, um, you know, this year. So, you know, it's not being, it's actually not being led by investors. So, you know, that's that's the difference that we need to take into account. I think wages, you know, we've had, you know, we haven't had wage growth. Um, I think that's going to be interesting. As you see, you know, I touched on it before around migration and, and as that sort of goes out into regional Australia and what that actually does to wages who, you know, regional, in regional Australia, the wages have typically been lower. Um, so if you're doing your job from there, you would still be expecting to receive the same wages regardless of where you are. So I think that will that will have an impact and will be interesting to watch what happens there. Um, but, you know, asset prices are, you know, they, they are included, I think, in the RBA's uh, outlook. Um, you know, it'll be interesting, it'll be interesting to watch as, um, uh, as uh, the Governor Lowe comes out and makes further statements because, you know, it seems to be, seems to be changing so quickly um, that sometimes some of the statements that are made seem to get out of date with new data that comes out. So it'll be interesting to watch. Thank you. And Andrew, can we trust an economist who has arrived here today without a slide pack? <laughs> well, it's, it's a good point that Jason makes. I think uh, forecasting in this environment is a very humbling uh, 
task for economists, and often we are wrong before we've, between when we've created the PowerPoint presentation and delivered it, the world changes <laughs> and proves us wrong. So yeah, my key take out from the crisis was if you can avoid putting something down on paper, do so. <laughs> um, but I mean, just on the point of, uh, of asset prices, you know, we have seen some movement around the world. New Zealand mm -hmm. uh, just made changes uh, to their uh, macro proof settings. Um, and I agree with Matt. I think it's something that the RBA does look at. Um, they have to weight that in amongst the basket of considerations that they have. Uh, and, you know, no doubt if we do see changes in the uh, level of asset price growth or the composition of that growth, there could be further changes in the same direction from the Australian Central Bank. Okay, do I have a question from the table at the back? Surely. <laughs> it's a long walk from the back. <laughs> I can see why you placed the, the media there. <laughs> uh, Jack, Derwin, out. <laughs> Jack Derwin from Business Insider. Um, yesterday, the ABA unveiled its new set of hardship policies. Um, how, how big a difference do you think uh, those new hardship measures are going to make uh, post-March, given many of the options, uh, loan restructuring, in interest-only loans, um, have been on the table for months, uh, and, and there's still 28.7 uh, billion dollars worth of uh, deferred loans that can't be budged. Um, at some point, surely there is uh, no avoiding the prospect of uh, you know defaults rising, forced selling, particularly as income support is slashed. Um, yeah, could I get your view, your view on that? Thank you. Um, I think it would be very helpful to hear from both Matt and Marnie, who's, um, whose teams are right now sitting down and working with those customers and have got, I think, a lot of insights into which customers are facing you know, the harder decisions. But I might just, before calling on them, um, just the most recent data from the four major banks, so it's not the entire lending um, data that we will see. No, sorry, this is the most recent APRA data, sorry. I've looked at a lot of data in the last few days. Um, that shows that 91% of um, customers are now back um, making payments. But I think to get a sense of, you know, some of them are paying restructured loans, some of them have moved to interest only, most of them have moved back to the payments that they were making principal and interest prior to COVID. Um, at this stage, and I, I think we do need to acknowledge it's still very early days, um, the number of customers who have exited deferrals and are now into, uh, who are now, have their loans impaired, is 1.4% of all of those um, who deferred their loans throughout um, to, to date. So you're not regarded as an impaired loan until you're 90 days in arrears. So there's obviously a number of customers who might be getting closer to that point. And I would expect that 1.4% to grow, but I'd be very surprised if it's going to, you know, grow tenfold in the next two months. But nevertheless, even 1.4 is a small percentage, but it's still thousands of people and it is going to be some real challenges. So Matt or, and Mani. Mani, do you want to start in terms of some of your observations, what you're seeing or what your hardship teams, what they're, the sorts of customers they're worried about, how that might intersect with changes to JobKeeper? You know, what are, the, what are the kinds of cases that are keeping you and your team up at night? Yeah, well, we have, um, we've been working directly with each of our customers that, that are in that, in, that, in that tail there, and they predominantly relate uh, and especially on the, the business side, but as an individual, if, if you're reliant on, um, you know, borders, especially international borders opening up, which we know won't open up for really for quite some time. Um, you know, there's a number of industries that are, you know, that, that have had it tougher through this period of time. And, and like I said, individuals also associated with those, with those industries. So um, we took the we took the view um, and the way that we actually worked with our customers was directly to understand their individual circumstances because everyone is different um, and to tailor solutions specific uh, to those uh, individuals. Our hardship, our hardship guidelines, the way that we had approached hardship um, has not changed through COVID. It's the same as what it was previously. Um, so we will continue to work regardless of COVID um, the same way, um, you know, with our customers. And I think the, um, the guidelines from an in industry perspective, I think have been a really good move um, in a sense that there is, 
you know, perhaps quite a bit of confusion um, out there about just, just how do you approach your financial institution? Where do you go? What can you expect? Um, and so to have some consistency across the banking industry, uh, regardless of the bank that you're with, I think is, um, it will be really valuable and to have it accessible like it is uh, via all our websites um, just makes it a lot easier for uh, customers should they, should they be in that situation. Um, Matt, if you could maybe comment in general terms, but I do actually have a question that's come in that's very related and it's talking specifically about um, sectors such as, well, names Qantas here, but aviation and cruise operators. Um, what do you see for them? Can they survive until 2022 and what are your thoughts? Sure, and I'll, I'll try to be relatively quick because I know we've got Clancy yes. waiting for the next question. We've only got a few minutes uh, and left. And I should say, this is the last question, so make it a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, overall what we've seen in, uh, in a housing book, uh, if the, those have come out of uh, deferrals, 1% have gone to impaired, 3% have gone to interest only, and 4% requiring further assistance. The rest of the 92% um, are back on their uh, repayment terms where they were in COVID. I mean, you would expect I mean, one of the things as you looked, particularly at the end of calendar 2020, is the number of insolvencies across Australia is broadly half of what it would have otherwise been in a normal year. The number of customers that are going through a sale process uh, in housing due to financial difficulty is half what it would have been in, other, in, a, in prior years. So it gives you a sense of how much um, you know, support uh, was put in place. Now, of course, there will be some, even though the numbers in aggregate um, look extremely uh, good. I mean, much better than realistically any of us could have hoped. There is, of course, every individual business, uh, any per any individual in those sets of circumstances is always very challenging. Um, and of course, it's important for every financial institution to make sure we deal with that you know, very sensitively uh, uh, and with real empathy. Some of the sectors that you mentioned, and absolutely, if you have I been mean, airlines, aviation, obviously international travel, uh, you know, student accommodation related to education. You know, all very tough sectors. I mean, I was talking to um, one of our senior uh, business bankers uh, last night who happened to be in, uh, in Cairns, and they, he was telling me a story about uh, a dive operator that was, uh, that was there, and that's clearly a very challenged business. And actually what they'd done is they'd redeployed their vessels. One was going down to Tasmania, uh, Mark is in business banking here, uh, probably knows the rest of the story. I think one was going to WA, basically taking advantage of a very strong domestic uh, tourism market. Um, so hopefully there'll be as many of those sorts of cases uh, as possible, but clearly, and it's the unfair nature, I guess, of any crisis, and particularly a pandemic, you know, some businesses have done extremely well, and some through no fault of their own are in a, you know, a very difficult uh, situation. So I think certainly the commitment across the industry is to support those customers as best we can, but we absolutely recognise there'll be some difficult decisions during the course of the year. Clancy. Uh, Clancy Yates from the Sydney Morning Herald. Um, Matt, just a quick question. Do you agree with Andrew's point about how the response to COVID-19 in 2021 should change with perhaps states being, uh, or some states being a little bit less blunt and uh, fewer lockdowns and perhaps adopting a bit more of a New South Wales approach? <laughs> <laughs> I'd, uh, I mean, uh, I'd characterise Andrew's comments about there being some you know, considered and you know, proportionate responses during the course of the year. I think it's very hard to disagree with that as a starting proposition. It's clearly a difficult area to navigate given, I mean, health, health policy, health outcomes is the most important element of economic policy. Uh, I think, you know, everyone has tried to navigate through that as, as, uh, as well as possible. And I mean, New South Wales has managed that extremely well. Uh, and, um, you know, we're, we're certainly, I think the beneficiaries uh, of that approach in New South Wales. I'm sure you're satisfied with that, Clancy. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, can I um, thank all of you for being here today. To our um, guests who have been, who have joined us virtually, uh, thank you for your interest. Uh, the ABA is very keen to keep working with the um, Trans Tasman Forum to make this an annual event. We think it's a good way to start the year to start thinking. To, about what's ahead of us, what are the big challenges, where are the hurdles, what are the opportunities, and we look forward to the chance next year to share those thoughts 
uh, and insights with you again. Can I ask you to thank each of our panellists? Um, Andrew Charlton, thank you. Yeah. Terrific insights. Um, the chair of the Australian Banking Association, Matt Coman. Matt, thank you for your time. And our Deputy Chair, Marnie Baker. Marnie, terrific to have you with us. Sorry it wasn't in person, but I can assure you we, we could see you and hear you brilliantly. So thank you, Marnie. Yeah. Thank you. I'm Tony Damien. I am the co-chair of the Global Bank Sector Group at Herbert Smith Freehills. And it's my great pleasure uh, to give the formal vote of thanks to our, our panel today. Uh, excellent contributions from, from all of you. Um, Andrew, Marnie, Matt, Anna, you were not only generous with your time, but generous with your thoughts. And that was really at the core of uh, the discussion and what made it so interesting. Uh, I'm told I have to call out something from all of that. I'm gonna call out one thing that I think was really important and for all of us to think about and take away. Matt mentioned uh, the remarkable recovery that we've, we've witnessed over the past 12 months at the depths of the crisis the panellists talked about expectations and some potentially uh, unattractive scenarios. That didn't end up happening. And the reason that that didn't end up happening, as the panellists discussed, was a really coordinated effort between government, business, led by the banks, the community and indeed the country. This idea of a national effort to uh, look into a once, you know, once in a hundred year crisis and to meet the challenge of that once in a hundred year crisis. Now, because things have gone well, uh, we probably take that for granted. We probably gloss over that national effort. Um, you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, I am prepared to make a forecast and my forecast is that there will be other challenges. We're not, not through the COVID yet and there'll be challenges that we'll face that are unrelated to COVID. We need to keep the idea of this national effort if we are to meet those new challenges. And so, uh, to call out one aspect of a really interesting discussion today, that's the one uh, that I'd, I'd turn to, obviously many others. The reason there were many others and the reason it was such a fascinating discussion was because uh, the wonderful contributions of our panellists. So whether you're here in the room, whether you're back in the office or whether you're at home, uh, could you please put your hands together for a big warm thanks. Very briefly, uh, a couple of other thanks, of course, to the circle. Um, Johnny and your family, um, my thoughts are with you, and I know the thoughts of everyone in this room are with you. Uh, to uh, the Hyatt Regency people who've looked after us here today, thank you very much. Uh, Herbert Smith Freehills has some other platinum partners with us today, and so to Australia Post, to CBHS Health, and to ServiceNow, thank you. Uh, it feels very 2021 to have an official streaming partner at an event. <laughs> and so to enlighten operational excellence, thank you. If you are watching this remotely, I hope it worked. <laughs> and uh, all that is left is for me to say thank you everyone. Uh, the event is now concluded and have a great day. Cheers. <laughs>